All right, so it's time to go ahead and begin. So today's class is on structural modeling. So after uh, the lecture and activity today, you should be able to finish lab two. Okay, but um, the first part of lab two was uh, creating both the design source and a sim file for the app adder, and then also the full adder. So how many people have a half adder and full adder simulating correctly? Okay, quite a few. Okay, so uh, that would be the first thing to do today. If, if you don't have a half adder and a full adder simulating correctly, you would wanna do that before you start with the structural modeling that I'm gonna go, go over. Okay. And as you can see from the agenda, first I just wanna review the half adder and full adder. So we'll go over some of the things we covered last time, and then we'll go into the new material on the structural modeling. So first of all, uh, remember, we have what's called a high level black box diagram. And the high level black box diagram, it shows the main inputs and main outputs of that uh, module. So the half adder has how many inputs? Two. And you probably call them A and B. But like I mentioned in a previous class, um, it's good to get into a habit, especially from here on out uh, this quarter to be more descriptive with your inputs and outputs. Now, if you already called your half adder and full adder, you know, just input A, B, and output S, C, and, you know, they're simulating correctly, that's fine. But, you know, for future labs, uh, you know, try to use more descriptive names for inputs and outputs because Starting with this lab, we're starting to get a little bit more complex where we're going to have, you know, multiple modules instead of just, you know, a single module. And again, it, it helps by being more descriptive with your names and outputs when you're looking at a timing diagram. Because if everything's A and everything's B, you know, it's hard to distinguish, well, what is this A for which, you know, modules? Okay. So, you know, maybe... HA underscore A and HA underscore B would be a little bit more uh, descriptive. And then how many outputs for the half adder? Two. All right, one is the sum. Which you could just have a C. And then uh, remember we had the truth table. Now in the truth table, I'm just going to use A, B, C. So since we have two inputs, how many uh, rows in the truth table? Four. I mean, that's the old two to the two, right? Two to the number of bits gives you the number of values. And then we remember when we came up with the outputs, we were just adding these single bits. So zero plus zero, just zero, zero plus one, one, one plus zero, one, one plus one, two, which is one, zero. Uh, in binary. And then what kind of gate did you use for the C output? For the C output, it's only a one when all inputs are one. And, and what kind of gate did you use for the S output? Exclusive or good. All right, so any questions on the half adder again? Just a quick little review of what we did last time. Okay, full adder, how many inputs? Three. Three. Right, so maybe you did like full adder underscore A, full adder underscore B, and then full adder underscore C out of maybe. How many outputs? Two. Two. Maybe FA or S. FA underscore C zero. Okay, again, the truth table, I'm just going to use AB, CI, and CO, and S. So three inputs. So how many rows in the truth table? Eight. Just counting in binary.
So two, four, six, eight, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Always good to check because it's easy to make a mistake when you're writing those down. So then we're just adding the three bits. So all zeros added together, zero. Any row where only one of the bits is a one, then it's going to give us a result of one. That's zero, one there, zero, one. Any row that has two ones, we'll have a result of two, one, zero. All right, and then three ones, of course, is a binary three, so both outputs will be a one. Okay, so everybody agree I didn't make a mistake? Everybody good? Okay, so, uh, you know, we, we, we went over the half adder and the full adder last time. Also last time we talked about multi-bit addition, right? And I had an example of adding two four-bit binary numbers. And I have another example here. It's adding two different numbers, but no matter what the numbers are that you're adding, you do it the same approach, right? But you just add column by column, starting with the least significant bit column, right? So it's the same as what you, you know, you, again, you probably punch into a calculator now, but back when you used to manually add multi-digit base 10, right? It's the same, same concept. So what am I going to write here? What? What am I going to write here? Zero. Zero, what else? Very one. And what it goes here? Zero. What else? Very. What are we going to write here? Yeah, carry over goods. Okay, and you can always double check by just converting these to base 10. What's this binary in base 10? 1011 one, one binary is what in base 10? You should be able to do this pretty quickly. What did you say? 11, yeah, because we have an 8, we have a 2, we have a 1, we don't have a 4. So this is 11 in base 10. Okay, what's this in base 10? 14. 14. So is this correct? Because what would this be in base 10? Funny about right? Because we have a one, no two, no four. We have an eight, we have a 16. So 16, eight, one, 25. Okay. Now we'll come back to this example in a little bit, but um, any problem to this point? It was what we reviewed last time. So everybody good? All right. So now we're going to start into uh, new material um, by looking at structural modeling. And the example we're going to use is the design that you're doing for lab two. We call the ripple carry adder. Um, it's an adding circuit where you add multiple bit binary numbers. And you can have ripple carry adders that, you know, add up to whatever number of bits you want to add up to. Ours is going to be a four-bit ripple carry adder. So let's start with the high-level black box diagram for a ripple carry adder, the RCA. And remember, the high-level black box diagram, just like we did for the half adder and full adder, and for the RCA, it's no different. It shows the main inputs and the main outputs of that um, module. So what are our inputs here? If, if I label this binary number A, and I label uh, this binary number here B, and then I call these four bits S, and I call this single bit carry out, what's going to go on the input side of this high-level black box diagram? Because what are inputs? A and B, yeah, what you're adding are the inputs. Now, here's something that you haven't seen yet, because up to this point in the class, all the inputs and outputs have been single bit. But you see here, we're adding two four-bit binary numbers. So we have two four-bit inputs. So on a high-level black box diagram, the way we would show A and B as four bits is you put a slash and then the number four. Okay, so anytime you have an input or an output that is more than one bit, that's how you signify it in a 
uh, diagram. You put a slash with the number of bits next to the slash. Okay. So how many outputs? Two, right? The result is the output. And we're calling these four bits an output S, and we're calling this single bit an output C0 for carry out. So on the output side, you have a slash four uh, for S. And if it's a single bit, you don't put a slash, right? Just like prior to today, right? Everything prior to today has been single bit. And we never put a slash, right? You only put a slash if it's more than a single bit. And once people see slashes, they get carried away because they start to see this. Okay, but that's not right. Okay, it's, it's, again, it's against convention. If it's a single bit, you don't put a slash. Okay? All right, so that's the high level black box diagram for the ripple carry out. And again, it shows the main inputs and the main outputs. Now, we're going to look at the low level. And it's also called the structural uh, diagram of this RCA. So you, you can notice here that I've drawn a dashed box around these four other ones. And the reason I did that is because what's within the dashed box represents what makes up this RCA. And you see how I have these two arrows outside the dash box and I get two arrows down below also outside the dash box. Well, these two arrows represent the main inputs to the RCA and these two arrows represent the main outputs. So you see, I put slash four here and label this A, let's say, slash four here, label this B, slash four here, and this would be the S output. And then this is just a single, single bit output, so it doesn't get a flash, but that's our carry out. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm out of view. Let's see, we'll try to maximize this. I go. Okay, there we go. That's good. All right, thank you. Okay, so now notice within the dash box, I got these four squares. And as I talked about last time, and as we just did manually, right? When we manually add these multiple bit binary numbers, we do it column by column, starting with the least significant bit, right? The furthest to the right. Well, the hardware also adds multiple bit binary numbers column by column. So you need an adder for each bit that's being added, right? So since we're adding two four bit binary numbers, we need four adding circuits. You know, if you were adding 63, two 63 bit binary numbers, you would need 63 adders, okay? And we talked about last time how this least significant bit can be a half adder, right? But these other bits, other columns of bits, the adding circuit has to be a full adder. What's the reason for that again? Why can I use a half adder for this column, but not for the other columns? Yeah, because are we ever gonna get a carry in to this least significant bit? No. Right? You can only have a carry in for these other, right? So that's why those have to be full adders, but this can be a half adder. Okay, so the RCA, it's going to have a half adder to add the least significant bits, but then for all the other bits, you need full adders. So these three are going to be full adders. Okay, so now I'm going to put in what I use for names for the inputs and outputs for these adders, okay? You know, A and B for the half adder. Now, you know, whatever you use for name in your design, that's what you would have to put here. So, you know, if you did use like HA underscore A, you know, that's what you would put, right? HA underscore B, that's what you did. Or if you use some other name, that's what you would put there. Okay, then likewise, 
we have a sum output and a carry out output for the half adder. All right, and then for the full adder, we have three inputs, right? A, B, C, I. We also have two outputs, say S and C0. So I put that in here for each of the full adders that I have. Okay, so now for this half adder, I'm going to connect the A input of my half adder to the least significant bit of my main A input that I'm adding. Now, remember, we talked about how, you know, this one's column is the two to the zero, right? This two's column, that's the two to the one, and the four is two to the two. And the eight is two to the three. Well, the reason I repeat this is because we'll call the least significant bit the zeroth bit. And the reason we call it the zeroth bit is because of the power, right? The zero power for the ones. And we call this next bit the first bit because right? it has a power of one. We call this the second bit. We call this the third bit. Okay. That's always by convention that we always call the least significant bit the zeroth bit. And then whatever the most significant bit is, it's that number. That's because we have four bits here, the most significant bit is three, right? But if you had eight bits, then the most significant number would be seven, right? Because you started with zero, okay? So this half adder is gonna add the two zero with bits. It's gonna add uh, bit zero of A to bit zero of B. E. So I would show that as, a, and then in square brackets is zero, and then B, square brackets is zero. Okay. And then this full adder is going to be adding the first bit of A and B. Okay, so I would show that as A, square bracket one, B, square bracket one. And then this full adder is going to be adding the second bit of A and B. So this would be A, bracket two, B, bracket two. And then the most significant bit is added by this full adder, so that would add A, 3, and B. So everybody see how we, how we did that? Okay, now, the result, right, the S result of this half adder is going to be the zeroth bit of the result. So it will be this bit here. And then the S here would go, well, actually, I should draw this outside the dashboard. It should be out here. That's good. Okay, because we're talking about a mean output now. And then this would be S1. This would be S2. This would be S3. Okay, remember, carry out of the RCA is a single bit. So this doesn't get a bracket. The number. It's just a single bit. All right, so you see, like these four individual outputs become the four bit output of the RCA. It's like these inputs of the RCA split up into single bits into each adder. Okay. So any questions about anything thus far? Because the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you the connections we have to make between the adders. Okay. Uh, we have to make a connection between this carry out of the half adder and this carry in of the full adder. And then we got to make a connection between this carry out of this full adder and the carry in of that full adder. And then this carry out of this full adder will go to the carry in of that full adder. And then this carry out of this most significant uh, bit full adder will just connect right to our RCA carry out output. So you know that would be this bit here. Okay, now in system Verilog, and this also goes for Verilog, when you make connections between lower level modules, so you know, here we're making a connection between the carryout of this lower level module HA to this 
lower level input CI of this full adder uh, module. Well, anytime you're making connections between low level modules, you have to do it through what's called an internal signal. Okay, and you can label internal signals whatever you want. And it's good to be descriptive with internal signals, just like with input and output names. But here, I'm just going to call my internal signals uh, T1, you know, T with a number. So I'm going to call this internal signal T1. I'm going to name this one T2, name this one T3. But you can basically name internal signals anything you want, just like you can name inputs and outputs, whatever you want. Okay, so you know, up here, P1, P2, P3, call external signals. I just think of them as connections. I think of them as nodes. They're nodes between lower level modules. See, when you're connecting from a low level module to a high level output or input, like we did like we're doing here for S and also for A and B, you do not need an internal signal to do that. It's only when you're connecting between low level inputs and outputs that you need an internal signal. And again, that's just based on how Verilog works. Okay, so this is all like the preliminary um, information you need before we can start talking about like how you would actually model this in uh, system Verilog. So before we start into that, uh, any questions up to this point? Questions? Okay. So source window, like say you're looking at your computer screen, you're right, you got Vivado open, you're looking at your source window. Well, if you've uh, simulated your half adder and your full adder, you should have a half adder for your design source, or I should say a design source for your half adder, a design source for your full adder, and also SIM files for each one. Well, today, in order to connect these up into this RCA, this adding circuit, you have to have you have to add a third file, a third design source, and a third SIM file. And let's say you call it RCA, even RCA. So you know, you'll add RCA design source, and you'll also add RCA uh, test patch okay, for simplot. And you know how we talked about in order to simulate one of these files, you know, once you have multiple files within the same project, when you go to simulate one of them, you have to make sure both the design source and its corresponding sim file are set as the top module. Right, so remember how we talked about, you know, if you, excuse me, if, if you want to sim your full adder, well, both your full adder design source and your full adder uh, sim file have to be the top module, and that pyramid symbol indicates what the top module is, and you all know how to set the top module. You have to write, you just right-click the file, and it's an option in the window that appears. Okay, so, you know, you have to do that for the full adder, and you'd have to make the top, um, SIM file for the half adder and set the top for the uh, design source for the half adder to simulate that. And then when you get ready to simulate the overall design, which is the RCA, well, you're going to have to make that SIM file the top module and also its design source the top. Okay. So by the time you finish lab two, you've done three simulations, right? You simulate the half adder and the full adder first. Doesn't matter what order you do the half adder and full adder in. But then once those are done, then once you have this design source completed, and I'm going to show you uh, how to do that, uh, you would have to sim that overall design. Now, the only sim that you show in what you turn in is the one for the RCA. And the only demo that you make a video of is the demo for the RCA. Okay, because the RCA won't work if your half adder and full adder aren't working. So, you know, if we see that you're RCA demo and your RCA simulation is good. We know your half adder and full adder is good. Okay? That's why in troubleshooting, uh, you know, if your RCA doesn't work, well, you got to go back and re-simulate your full adder and half adder. Now, a lot of times people will try to skip it, 
<laughs> like they never stimulate the low level molecules first. Okay, and that's why it doesn't make sense to do that because if you're high level, you know, your um, overall design doesn't work well, you got to first check that your low levels are working by themselves, right? Because if the low levels don't work, the high level is not going to work. Okay, next thing. Well, any questions on what I just talked about here? Okay, next thing is recall that in your sim file, there's a line of code that looks like this. I didn't write the whole thing here, but there's a line of code that has a file name, right? This is the file that you want to simulate, right? The name of the file you want to simulate, the design source file. And then it's followed by UUT. UUT stands for unit under test, right? So this is the file, the design source that you're testing with your sim file. And the main thing, that I want to focus on because you're going to see that this um, this is involved with the structural model that we're going to talk about in just a second. Is that after you UUT, there's this line where you have dot and then the name of either an input or output that's in your design source, and then in parentheses you have um, an input or output of your sim file. Now. In the sim file, you don't use input and output when you declare them. You use logic, right? But if this is an input, you're connecting it essentially to an input. And you know, if this is an output, you're essentially connecting it to an output. So I talk about this in my intro video to Vado, but I think sometimes people just forget it or they overlook it. This is the code that's actually connecting the inputs and outputs of your design source to the inputs and outputs of your sim file so it can run the simulation. So, you know, this dot name in parentheses name, that's making a connection, okay? Well, this same syntax is used to make connections between these lower level modules that uh, your structural design uh, file has, okay? So, you know, what I'm about to show you, the the main code that I'm about to show you that would go in your RCA to make the connections between those adding circuits, you've already seen before, okay? Because it's it's this syntax, right? Okay, so let me turn this just a little bit. There we go. All right, so for your RCA design source, just like your other design sources that you've done this quarter, at the top is where you declare the inputs and outputs, right? So it's no different in this RCA. Okay, at the top, you know, you're gonna have your module name, you know, I think it's like module, then RCA, and then what, there's like parentheses, and then you have your inputs and output declarations, and then there's like closed parentheses with a semicolon, if I remember right. Well, same thing here with the RCA, but there's one thing you haven't seen before, and that's how do you declare inputs and outputs that have multiple bits, right? Because everything up to this point, the inputs and outputs have been single bits. Well, the only thing that's different is that, let's say we want to declare input A. Well, we'd write input just like we've been doing, and we write A, but what's new is that in between input in the input name, to declare it as multiple bits, you do this. Okay, in square brackets, uh, you put zero for the least significant bit, because we always call the least significant bit the zero with bit. And then because it's four bits, the most significant bit would be the third bit. Okay. It's in this case, in between input and brackets, or is it directly? Well, in system Verilog or Verilog, white space doesn't matter. So yeah, whether you have spaces or not, I mean, spaces are good for readability, but yeah, as far as like whether you have spaces or not, it would be the, the same, it would work the same way. Yeah. Okay. And you know, um, you'd also put a semicolon. Okay, and same thing, if you had an output like we do here, we have an output that's four bits, you know, you put output three to zero, you know, whatever the name is. Actually, I'm trying to remember. These aren't semicolons. These are commas. Yeah, the semicolons. Yeah, I always, I always uh, 
mix them up because in the sim file, you know, when you write logic, it's a semicolon, but in the design source, it's a comma. I always forget that. Now, uh, this carry out output is a single bit. So you would just write that like you did just output C0, right? There's no need to put square brackets with numbers of it single bit like you've been doing. Okay. So that's how you would declare uh, multiple bit uh, inputs and outputs. You know, I'm not writing everything here because you'd have to put another input for B. Okay, so you can fill in the spaces or the gaps. Uh, but the next thing you would put after you declare your inputs and outputs, you have to declare these internal signals. Okay, T1, T2, and T3. And the way you declare internal signals is you use the word logic. And since these are single bit, you would just list them T1, T2, T3. Right? So these declare internal signals. Declare. Okay. All right. Now comes the code that's going to connect these lower level modules together into our overall design. So the first thing is you put the file name. Right? So assuming you called your half adder file HA, you know, if you called it something else, you would put whatever you called it here. So this is the file name. Point to HA. So HA is the file name. The next thing that comes on this line is a label. And, and the label can be anything you want. I'm going to label this HA zero. You know, half adder for the zero with bit. Okay, so this is a label. Somebody in the previous section, and I usually get this question at least once every quarter. Uh, they always ask, well, is the label necessary? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm, I think I read sometime way back when I was first learning about Verilog that it's optional, but even though it's optional, I would always use a label. Okay, I think it's a good idea, especially when you start getting large circuits with lots of lower level modules. It's good to have a label to each module. So even if it's optional, I'll make it a requirement. Have a label. Okay, but now comes the code that makes the connection. So just like this line in your SIM file, you started with the parentheses. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm looking at the half adder, right? Because that's the file. Now it doesn't matter what order I go in. I'm going to do A first, then B, then S, then carry out. But again, order doesn't matter. But to make this connection between the A of the half adder and A zero, I would just do dot A, and that's this A of the half adder, and then in parentheses, what it's connected to, which is gonna be the zeroth bit of the main A input, All right? So see this right here is making the connection between this input A and this zeroth bit A of the main input. Okay, and then put a comma, and now I'm going to connect input B of the half adder to the zeroth bit of the main input. Now, you know, I'm running out of space here, but you can just continue on the same line. But since I ran out of space, I'm going to come below here, and I'm going to do S next. So it'd be dot S, then in parentheses, S0. And comma. Now here's where it gets a little bit different. Okay, here for carry out, I cannot make a connection right to CI, okay? Verilog doesn't work like that. Uh, what I do is I make a connection between C0 and T1, okay, our internal signal. So I would write dot uh, C0, Actually, I think I just called this C. 
Let me correct that. I just called it C over there, so let's just call it C. All right, so dot C, what I call the output of the um, uh, half adder, the carry out of the half adder, and then in parentheses, T1. And then you'd have to close parentheses and put a semicolon. Okay, so you see what this syntax does. It just makes the connection from the C output to this internal T1. It hasn't connected it to CI the full adder yet. See, it takes another line of code uh, to do that. Okay, but does everybody see how I did this, the process, right? I'm just looking at the inputs and outputs of the half adder. That's what goes first. See the dot A, dot B, dot S, dot C? That's looking here at the half adder inputs and outputs. And then in parentheses, you put what it's connecting to. Okay. Any questions? All right. I'll do one more. I'll show you how to connect this second full adder, but then you're going to finish it. Okay. So uh, for that full adder here, well, first goes the file name, which is FA. At least that's what I called it. Okay. And then again, a label. Uh, I use label FA1. You know, this is my full adder one, this is my full adder two, this is my full adder three. Uh, then you put parentheses, and now I'm looking at the full adder. See, I'm looking at the inputs and outputs of the full adder. So the A input of the full adder connects to the first bit of the main input A. Oops. So that connects the A input of the full adder to the first uh, bit of the main A input. And then comma, then the B input of the full adder is going to the first bit of B of the main. And then I'm going to skip CI and come back to that. We'll go to S next. So dot S. In parentheses, S1. Okay, now I'm going to do CI. Okay, well, just like I can't connect C directly to CI, I can't direct CI directly to C. But I connected C to T1, and now I'm going to connect CI to T1, right? Because if CI is connected to T1 and C is connected to T1, that means C is connected to CI. <laughs> okay, so you see when you have connections between lower level modules, it takes like two pieces of syntax to make the connection, okay? So I would put here dot CI, and then in parentheses, T1. And these two together, see these two pieces of code together make the connection between the carry of the half adder and the carry in of that first full arm. Okay, and then the next thing I would have to do is connect uh, C0 to T2. Okay, so do you think you could finish this? Right, you'd have to do another line for this full adder, another line for this full adder. And notice for this full adder, the carry out connects directly to the carry out of the RCA. So you don't need an internal signal, like you don't need a T4 because this is going from lower level to high level. Anytime you go low level to high level, doesn't require an internal signal. In fact, I think if you put an internal signal, I think you get an error. Okay? Now, I wanna stress this because when I don't stress this, uh, people tend to make this mistake. The mistake people often make is they see three full adders here, right? And they think that they need three low level full adder design sources, but you don't. You just need a single full adder design source, which a lot of you already have and you've simulated and it's correct, so you're good to go. It's just that the RCA, right? The structural model code that's making the connections, it's just using that same file three times. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so like I said at the beginning, if you have a good half adder simulation and a good full adder simulation, like right now, 
what you have to do for lab two is just add another design choice RCA that's going to have this code and add another SIM file for RCA. In the SIM file for RCA, it's the same format as SIM files that you've been doing. But what's going to be different because you have multiple bit inputs and outputs is that in your SIM file where you define the inputs and outputs using logic, you're also going to use this three to zero to declare those inputs and outputs of your SIM as also four bits. And then in your test cases, and I'm going to get to the test cases in a second, in your test cases, instead of having inputs that are just a single bit, like they've been up to this point, you now have test cases where each input is four bits. So instead of just saying like A equal to zero or you know B equal to one, you're going to have to put A equal to so this is in your test bench. So the test bench uh, for RCA. You know, when you get to the test cases, you'll have like A equal four, tick mark B, you know, zero, 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 one, you know, whatever the four bits you want that input to equal to. Right? And then you'll have also for B. You know, B equal four, tick mark B, zero, zero, one, zero, let's say. And then it ends with the semicolon. You know, and you'll have, you'll see that, um, you know, I'll get to the number of test cases coming up. Okay. Okay. So, any questions? You guys are being really quiet. I think you're, you're my quietest section. My, my morning section, which I would think would be the quietest, I think they're the rowdiest. And you guys are the quietest, and then my three to six, they're kind of in between. So it's either a good sign or a bad sign. Either you're getting this or you're totally lost. I hope it's the former. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, when you start to do this, if there's questions, you know, please ask. All right, the next thing is uh, the test cases to use. So I think I mentioned this last class, but let me repeat it. On Canvas, you know, I have a Word file that has the test cases for labs two through six. Those test cases are for the overall design. Okay, so these test cases are for the RCA. When you simulated your half adder, how many test cases did you have? Four, because this truth table has four rows. How many test cases do you have for your full adder? Eight. So this truth table has eight, right? So when you're simulating a half adder, you're using the truth table as your test pieces, and same thing with the full adder, okay? Okay, but your RCA, the test cases are four-bit, you know, two four-bit binary numbers that we're adding. Now, okay, some more review here. This is probably at least the fourth or fifth time I've asked this, where I've asked you how many values can you get from a certain number of bits, right? So how many values can I get from four bits? 16, right? 0 through 15. So uh, this A binary number could be any binary number 0 through 15. And also this B binary number that we're adding A to could also be any number 0 through 15. So since I have two <laughs> binary numbers that are four bits that each have 16 unique combinations, how many unique additions do I have? Very good. How do you get that? Yeah, just 16 squared, right? I mean, one way to think about it is if you made A zero, B could be zero through 15, right? So that's 16 there. Then if you made this one, again, B could be zero through 15. So that's another 16, right? So you see how it's 16 squared? So to completely test this RCA would require 256 test cases. Do you want to do 256 test cases? I mean, especially as you older, you realize that life is too short, right? Life is too short, definitely too short to do 256 test cases for an RCA. Now, some instructors will require you to do that, but because I'm older and, you know, life is too short, I'm not expecting you to do 256 test cases. What I've done is I've picked out test cases that have been strategically chosen. And the reason why I say they're strategically chosen is because these ten test cases will test the design of this RCA. And even though it's not a 100% test, 
it's probably like a 99.9% test, right? That if your RCA can pass these 10 test cases, there's a high probability that it would work for all 256 possibilities. But, you know, to be fair to the instructors or instructor that requires their students to do all 256 for this, I mean, to do a 100% test would require 256. So I don't, you know, want to downplay that, okay? But can you see how these were strategically picked? I mean, this one here is just one of the extremes, right? Zero plus zero. And this is the other extreme. What addition is this since all ones are here? We're adding what here? What two numbers? 15 plus this. But the rest of these, like the eight in between the two extremes, they were picked to test the design. If you just look at these two test cases here, can you see what's being tested here? Remember, when, when we add them manually, just like the hardware does, it's column by column. So what are we testing here? That half value? Yeah, you're testing the half value. You're testing the carry, right? I mean, here we should get a zero, or excuse me, a one with no carry. Here we should get a zero with the carry. So these two are, are testing basically the carry of the half value. What are these two testing? Yeah, the first full adder, right? Because see how if you just look at these two bits here, zero plus one, you don't get a carry one here, one plus one, zero with the carry. So you see, this is testing the carry of the half adder. This is testing the carry of the full adder one. This is testing the carry of full adder two. This is testing the uh, carry of full adder three. Okay. Again, it's not a 100% strict test. 20. 256 test cases would do that. But these 10 test cases do a good job testing the design. Okay, so if your simulation is good for these 10, it's a high probability that whatever 256, like if you ended up doing 256 on your board, that it would work for all 256. Okay? Now, one other thing I want to mention at this point is that in this class, Except for the final project, what do you think about this? No, I think even for the final project individual. So just the final project team, um, except for that, I give you the test cases that I want you to do for all the labs, okay? But I, but I want to um, you know, give you a heads up. And, and one of the reasons I mentioned this is I hope that even though I'm giving you the test cases, that when you get the test cases, you kind of look at them and think about them and say, okay, I see why, you know, even though we're not doing 256 test cases, you know, these would do a good job testing the design. Because when you take the follow-on class, the CP233, most instructors, including myself, we don't give you the test cases. You have to figure them out. Like you have to come up with the test cases that are gonna test that design. So even though I'm giving you the test cases, always think about, you know, why I chose, and I've even had students come up to me throughout the, you know, the past and be like, Gary, I know you don't have this test case. do you think that would be a good one too? And I'm like, oh yeah, that would be good. And I got it. So, you know, sometimes I miss good ones. So, so if you have a suggestion, uh, please, you know, bring it up. Okay. So we're at the top of the hour. Um, you want to take a five minute break or you want me to finish? I think it will take me about 10 or 15 minutes to finish. I just want to go over some things that are involved with your activity today. Because the activity is structural modeling. And actually the activity is going the opposite direction of what I did, right? I started with the diagram and I showed you the code. The activity is I give you code and I want you to draw the diagram. So it's going the opposite direction. So do you want me to keep going or you want to take a break? Keep going, okay, we'll keep going. Okay, so everybody should have an activity handout. It looks like this. Should have one, if you don't have one, let me know, I have extras. Does everybody at that table have one? No? Oh, okay. Anyone else need an activity handout? So the activity, 
there's three blocks of code. So each one of these blocks is a problem. Now, unlike other activities, because you know, I, I think you recall me saying, you know, right at the beginning of the quarter that, you know, every student at a table, do your own work, and then you know, you just passing for the one, uh, just passing one for your table. Well, what's different about this activity is if you want, you can split this up, you know. There's three here, so if there's three people at the table, you know, one person can do the top one, one person can do the middle one, one person can do uh, the last one, and then you know, you can put them together, turn them in if you want. Okay, I mean, if you want to do all of them, that's fine too. But this is the one activity where I don't require each student to do the whole thing. If you want to split it up, that's fine. Because my feeling is, if you can do one of these, chances are you can do the other two. They're not that much different. Okay. All right. So. First thing is there's a couple of uh, typos. The first typo is you see this arrow? Well, there's an arrow, right? Yeah. Just ignore that arrow. Okay, pretend it wasn't there. And then also the seven to zero in front of GT and LT. So you see where it says output seven to zero? It's right beneath that arrow. Um, and then GT, LT, that seven to zero shouldn't be there. Okay, because GT and LT, they're single bit outputs. They're not eight bits. Okay, and then the reason why you can ignore the arrow because it's not necessary to put the seven zero in front of B. Because we put the seven zero in front of A and you put a comma B, A and B will both be declared as eight bits. Okay, so that's why I say ignore the arrow. Okay, so everybody got that? Now, the next thing is, I listed up here what are inputs and what are outputs. Okay, you can see all these A, B, X1, X0, XCL, and so on. Those are inputs, and then below it, these are outputs. Now, the reason I list these up here is because when you make your diagram, put your inputs either on the left side or the top, and put your outputs on the right side or the bottom. Okay, it's, it's not typically done that you put outputs on the left or the top, or you put inputs on the right or the bottom, okay? And see this code here that you see, this is the structural model code. So this code corresponds to like this RCA code that we went over, right? That's connecting the lower level modules together. In the code, remember the first uh, what's first on a line is the file name. So you see like module sort. Sort is the structural model, right? That's the, um, you know, the high level, like the RCA. And then COMP -C and MUX, those are the lower level modules. Those are like half adder, full adder in this RCA example. So in order for you to know or to determine yourself what the inputs in outputs of COMP and MUXR, you would need that code of those lower level modules, which you're not given. Okay, so that's why I'm just listing them out for you. Okay, instead of giving you, you know, a bunch of code, you know, for the lower levels, which again, wouldn't really, you know, I think produce much as far as uh, learning. I'm, I'm just giving you what they are. Okay. All right, but, the, but there's a couple of uh, items that are in, um, well, actually two modules, because module sort, that module, the code is a lot like what it is for the RCA. Okay, so um, what you see from module sort, there's nothing really new other than what we talked about already with RCA. But for module pizza and module fruit, there are some things in that code that are new, that's not part of the RCA code, okay? So the first thing is, if you look at module pizza, there's examples of what are of what's <coughs> called concatenation. Has anyone heard that word before? Concatenation. It took me a long time to pronounce that correctly. I used to get it all messed up, but I finally somehow say say it pretty consistently now without embarrassing myself. Um, but what concatenation means is just the joining of. Okay, and here we're talking about joining bits together. So if you look at the pizza module, and I didn't write everything down here. I just wrote the pieces of code that are pertinent to what 
you know, point I'm trying to make. So if you look at the code from module pizza, you'll see a line logic, and then one to zero, and then T2, T3, T4. So how many bits is this? Two. two. So you see, this is declaring these internal signals as two bits. Now, if you look at the line of the pizza module where it has cheese and then the label C2, and then within the parentheses, you'll see this, you'll see dot H, and then in parentheses, you'll see braces and then a one comma T2. Okay, so remember um, the dot with the H here is, and then with what's in parentheses, it's making a connection between H and what's in parentheses. Now, what's new is that we have these braces. Well, braces are used to join bits together. Okay, so this is doing concatenation. And what it's joining is it's joining the two bits of T2, right? Because T2 is defined as two bits. It's joining the two, two bits of T2 with another bit that's equal to one. So it's making this a total of three bits, right? Because it's taking these two bits and adding a one to it. So the reason that's significant is because that tells us that this H, whether it's an input or output, and I guess it's an input based on what I wrote up. It's telling us that input is three bits. See, because if we just had T2 here, like say we didn't use concatenation, we had dot H in parentheses T2, that would be taking something that's three bits and connecting it to something that's two bits. And that's called a bit mismatch. Okay, when you connect things together, you want the bits to match. You want them to be an equal number of Over. bits. Okay, so that's what we're doing here with concatenation is we're making the bits equal. So this tells us that this H input has to be three bits because we're connecting it to something that's three bits. Now, by the way, and you'll see examples of this later on in the quarter, um, you can join bits either to the left or the right. Like here, it's joining this one to the left of these two bits. But if I reverse the order, if I had T2 comma one, it would join that one to the right of the two bits. Also, you can join zeros if you want, instead of ones. In fact, you'll see later on in the quarter, there's a reason that we want to add multiple bits to the left of some other number of bits. And you'll see the reason why, you know, when we get there, it's not for why. Okay. Um, here's another example of concatenation. Okay, it's also in the pizza module. If you look where it says pepperoni, uh, and then there's P1, the label, and then where it starts uh, making the connections, the code that makes the connections, there's this code here, dot G, and then in parentheses, within braces, T3 and T4. So what this is doing, it's taking T3, which is two bits, and T4, which is two bits, and joining them together. So we're connecting G to four bits. So that must mean G is four bits. Okay? So that's what concatenation is all about. It's just joining bits together, okay? And again, the way you concatenate is you put it within braces with a comma between whatever you're joining. And you can actually join more than two things too. Like sometimes you might have three, four, you know, it can be any number of things you want, okay? All right, and then the last thing here is uh, in module root, so the bottom module, there's some examples of what's called splitting of bits. So again, I didn't write all the code down here, uh, but if you take a look at this line here, logic two to zero, T1, T3. So how many bits are T1 and T3? Three bits. How many bits are T2 and T4? Two, two bits. So now if you look, let's see where the, it's, um, it's on the same line as Apple two, okay, within the parentheses of Apple two. There's dot B and then in parentheses, T1 square brackets one to zero. So you see what this is doing is that it's connecting B only the two of the three <laughs> of T1. Okay, T1 is three bits, but we're connecting B only to two of the three bits. Okay, so that means B must be two bits. Okay, and then below, below here, we have an assigned statement. So you've already used the sign statement. You have to do a sign statement in both labs, zero and one. So here we're assigning the output Q 
to T3 bracket, square brackets one, board with T4, uh, square bracket zero. So what this is doing is that it's taking uh, the first bit of T3, right? T3 is three bits, but it's just taking one of the bits. It's just taking the first, right? Which would be the middle bit of the three, right? Because the least significant is zero, the most significant is two. So it's taking the middle bit of T3 and pouring it with the zeroth bit of T4, right? Because OR gates just have single bit inputs, right? You can't put multiple bits into one input of an OR gate, right? They don't work that way. But you see, this is how you choose one bit from multiple bits. So again, this is called splitting the bits. Sometimes it's called parsing bits. Yeah, that's another word for it. Okay. And you'll see that throughout the quarter, um, there'll be times when you have to do this, that you'll have something where you need to connect to not all the bits of a particular input or output, but just certain bits. And also you'll see that later on in the quarter, there's a need to do joining of bits to avoid a bit mismatch. Okay. So, with all of this, uh, you should now have enough information where you can complete this activity. I have the answer, the answers, the activity up here. So you would want to do that first. And then once you're done with the activity, you have enough information now to complete lab two. Um, again, let me mention, because last time, I can't remember, I don't think it was this section. I think it was my earlier section, but I had a couple people that left because it's okay to leave for the lab, but if you're gonna do that, make sure your table has finished the activity first, right? Because if you leave before your group has handed me the activity, I don't know if you are here for the entire activity. So what I would recommend is that if you're gonna leave to do the lab, you should be the person that turns in the activity for your group because then I know that you were here for the activity before you left, okay? So any questions on anything today before you start on work? Okay, so for the RC, when we make the RCA, uh, Bob, when we do an assign, we don't need to assign anything. Okay, you're talking about this RCA? Yeah. Yeah, well, you would create this RCA file the same way that you've created the half adder and full adder. Like it's within the same project. Like all these files are within the same project. So you know how you you started your half adder and your full adder? Yeah. Same thing for the RCA. I mean, you start it the same way. Also, the way the SIM file for the RCA, the format's all the same. The big difference is you have multiple bit inputs now instead of just all single bit. I mean, that's the big difference, but everything else is basically what you've been doing. I mean, did I answer your question or? Uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, if, you, you know, if it's still not clear, you ask me, I'll come over and help you. Okay, any other questions about anything today? Okay, well, if questions come up, please ask.